right, so uh, let's, let's talk a little bit uh, about hydrogen. And I'll start with something that we've already heard quite, uh, quite often today, so I'll go through it relatively quickly, and that is the inexorable ramp down of the cost of renewable electricity generation, right? Here I've used a curve from Fraunhofer which shows that basically every time that we doubled the install capacity of solar in the world, we dropped the price or the cost of that came down 23%. And there are equal learning curves for wind. So I think it's a foregone conclusion where our electric generation is going to come from. And if we look at it, so we've had seven doublings of PV over the last 15 years. We've had uh, four doublings of wind uh, in that same time frame. And if you sort of constrain ourselves, or we constrain ourselves to think about this only in terms of what's it going to take to make the electric consumption we have today renewable, then we only have a few left. Five doublings of PV, which is good, a lot of good cost down available, and about three in wind if there's going to be a reasonable balanced portfolio coming up to about 80% total renewables. But if we look at how much energy we still consume out of fossil-based fuels, then we have substantially more to go. And in fact, that I think is the theme of what we have been hearing today, and that is that in order to get to the greenhouse gas reductions that we want to achieve, both as a state, as a nation, and as a world, we need to tackle, we need to tackle fossil fuel energy generation. And so just in California, we have three times as much energy consumption off of fossil fuels than we do off of our electricity. And so that gives us a lot more to go. Part of the problem, and we've heard about this a little bit today already, is that as we continue to increase the amount of renewable generation on the grid, we have to have the systems to be able to deal with that. And we're here to propose that hydrogen is one of those systems. It certainly is not the only one. It is highly complementary to many of the others we've heard about today. Battery storage, demand response, uh, and other systems. And so a couple of, couple of points here, notes from CalISO earlier this year about how much they expect to actually have to curtail off the grid this year. We have an abundance of riches because of all of the excessive hydro, um, but that still means we're taking something on the order of 6,000 to 8,000 megawatts off the grid. If you look at just last month, we took 80,000 megawatt hours off the grid. And when we're saying taking off the grid, this tends to all be renewables, right? Because the loading order, ends up taking renewables off first, and mostly solar, because solar gets an investment tax credit rather than a production tax credit, and so therefore gets paid whether it produces or not. Most of this has been economically dispatched, meaning we've actually paid to take these resources off the grid, and they're the, they're the renewable ones that we want to actually utilize. So what, what can we do about it? Enter hydrogen. Um, so maybe a couple of facts. So. Uh, According to the last speaker, people don't like hydrogen. Maybe I can help you like it a little bit better. Um, so number one, it, it is the most abundant element in our universe. Makes up 75% of the mass and 90% if you count the number of atoms in our universe, right? So it is one of the things that we have the most of. Uh, it is also the third most abundant element on our planet. Um, yet, despite that, it only exists at about one part per million in our atmosphere. And the reason for that is it is also the smallest element. So when it is released in the atmosphere, it basically goes straight off into space. So it doesn't hang around. Um, it is also the highest energy, has the highest energy per weight or volume of any other element other than our nuclear elements, and we're getting rid of all of those. It ends up being about three times that of gasoline, 160 times that of lithium ion. So when you're talking about power to weight and ability to move and transport lots of energy, hydrogen is a phenomenal energy transport fuel. It is also green. All hydrogen is green once it is in its diatomic form, H2. So there is no way to burn it, combust it, use it, and generate a greenhouse gas or a short lived climate pollutant, right? However, how you make it can generate a lot of greenhouse gases. And the way that it's made mostly today, and by the way, there's about 62 uh, million metric tons of hydrogen produced in our world today, about 10 million in the US, uh, and California does about uh, 2,000 metric tons a day, produces that much hydrogen a day. And we do it predominantly through something called steam methane reforming. We crack methane using high, uh, high uh, temperature steam and turn it into hydrogen and unfortunately CO2. 
Um, for every metric ton of hydrogen we produce, we generate eight and a half metric tons of CO2. So it's not, not a really good equation. Some of that CO2 gets reused in, for instance, the refining process. Refineries are some of the biggest users, but not all of it does. And so a lot of it gets released. Um, so we need, a way of, we need a way of producing it. In fact, liberating it because we don't produce it. It exists in our known universe. We're simply taking it out of the things that exist in today. So we think electrolysis is the most effective way of doing that. And the reason for that is because of what we just talked about. We have all this incredibly abundant, renewable energy sources. They have zero cost fuels and they keep getting cheaper. And as we push electrification even further into all of our energy sources, we can get them to be even cheaper. So effectively, our source of energy ought to be cheaper for electrolysis than it is even utilizing uh, methane to crack it. <clears throat> and finally, if you use electrolysis, basically you're taking water, you're splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen. Once you use the hydrogen, the only product when you combust it is water. So in fact, we're also completely recyclable from that perspective. It's a nice, nice closed loop cycle. And so we think electrolysis via renewable sources of energy creates an ability to further decarbonize all of our energy sources as well as creates the opportunity to help balance the grid. So let me talk a little bit about some of those aspects. So we see, we've seen a fair amount of this uh, today as well. But when we're looking at more and more renewables put on the grid, we have more and more need to be able to shift those both seasonally as well as daily. And we've also seen the curve at the bottom, which shows us that the, that the variation can be quite substantial on a real-time basis as well. And so the interesting aspect is that electrolyzers, because they're so fast reacting, basically as soon as you put energy into an electrolyzer, it begins to produce hydrogen. It can turn itself, it turns on extremely quickly, tenths of seconds, it turns off extremely quickly, tenths of seconds, and for the most part, most can follow the load extremely dynamically. We'll talk about some of the innovations our company has come up with that we think were even better than others. But there's been multiple studies, here I cite one NREL uh, study that looks at the same things that we just saw presented by, uh, by the uh, gentleman from Cal ISO. So electrolyzers can do regulation, principally reg down, because they're basically ramping, you're turning them on to be able to take excess power on the grid. They can load follow, they can provide spinning reserve, they can provide non-spinning reserve, and even supplemental reserves as well. So I won't, uh, I won't belabor that point. Um, looking at transportation, so again, now moving further, we've heard a lot today about electrifying transportation, and that is phenomenal, but there are some modes of transportation that from an economic standpoint will be more and more difficult to electrify using battery electric vehicles. And I'll just point you to the ratio of power to weight that I talked about right at the very beginning, right? Hydrogen is 160 times more power in the same weight as a lithium ion battery. So for really heavy transportation, up in the, towards the top of the chart, uh, you can see that hydrogen could actually become more economical. And as we go even into the really biggest transportation, airplanes and others, it's a synthetic fuel made again from hydrogen and other CO, captured CO2, but we also want that to be renewable hydrogen so that that fuel is completely renewable in and of itself. And finally, we talked about storage. Uh, Jack Brower from uh, UCI mentioned hydrogen's ability to provide storage. This is a study from the European Commission on Storage. So the EU, in coming up with their winter package, studied all forms of storage and looked at the various uses and costs, and basically divided up into short duration, one hour, what they called medium duration, eight hours, and then long duration, 2,000 hours plus. And if you look at the very bottom, if you can see that, hydrogen storage, so taking renewable electricity, converting it to hydrogen, storing the hydrogen, and actually coming back to renewable electricity, or back to electricity via fuel cells, is even more cost effective than pumped hydro storage for large amounts and for long duration storage. And in fact, because of this, the EU, as part of their winter package and part of the reformation of market rules going forward, created the definition that you see on the bottom, which is that storage actually is not just energy deferring it a certain amount of electricity to point of end use, but also counts to changing energy carriers. 
And so therefore, by definition in Europe, if legislation passes, hydrogen converting electricity to hydrogen will be considered storage, which is important from some of the policy perspectives that we, the panel previously discussed. All right. Now a little bit, uh, a little bit about us and why we think we can uh, we can help accelerate this. Um, so we got our start doing with uh, with a number of researchers and a couple of universities in Australia, effectively looking to find out how does Mother Nature achieve the types of electrochemical reactions that it does as inexpensively as it does. Um, and so we looked at photosynthesis, like most uh, most companies or most. Uh, researchers would in trying to understand how do we mimic nature's ability to do photosynthesis as inexpensively, but how do we up the energy ratio, because of course we want much more energy out of these reactions than photosynthesis can give us, which at best is maybe 1%. And what this led to was a new type of, uh, of electrolysis. And what, it, what we found was that we could find materials that are earth abundant, not, uh, not platinum or other sophisticated uh, and expensive metals, uh, or uh, deleterious, uh, deleterious metals, but really cheap, earth-abundant materials that we could make catalytic, that nobody had thought could be catalytic. And then we found additional properties that we could make them behave with respect to gas and water very differently. So what this has resulted in is a, uh, is a machine that achieves greater than 90% stack efficiency, uh, and we believe at full system size, about 85% machine efficiency. To give you, a, to show you why this is so important is if we look at the way that hydrogen is produced today through steam methane reforming, that process is about 83 to 85% efficient. And since it produces 62, roughly 62 metric, a million metric tons of hydrogen a year, it's probably reached its economic optimum or its entitlement. It, the amount of energy that is needed to make hydrogen, whether you get the energy from natural gas, in the case of steam methane reforming, or from electricity, is the same. That's governed by, uh, that's governed by physics. And so if we can achieve the same efficiency or better, and with our renewables being able to drive the cost of that primary source of energy even below the cost of natural gas, then we have a way of making hydrogen cheaper than, we can, than any other form that exist today. And this is important because it can decarbonize all the heavy industry that uses hydrogen, not just as a fuel, but as, an elect as a chemical feedstock for its processes. It is important because we can take that hydrogen, that very inexpensive hydrogen, move it into heavy duty transportation that's difficult to electrify through electricity itself. And in some sectors, utilizing the existing natural gas pipelines, we can also move it into heating and, uh, and more domestic uses as well. And so my last slide is basically a view of that and what that looks like from a, a hydrogen set of pathways. Right? So we take large-scale electrolyzers, we hook them to the grid, they provide grid services and grid support while converting uh, the excess renewables or a certain amount of renewables into hydrogen. We can then distribute that hydrogen through classic fuel distribution mechanisms, whether that's pipelines or ships or, uh, or others. We can actually leverage it and store it and act have it as an emergency reserve to put back onto the grid through fuel cells, or we can decarbonize the industry that you see on the far side, whether it's transportation, whether it's energy use, chemical feedstocks, uh, and, uh, and building as well. And that's it. Thank you.